Good afternoon, and welcome to the General Motors Company's fourth quarter 2022 earnings conference call. During the opening remarks, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. After the opening remarks, we will conduct a question and answer session. We are asking analysts to please limit yourself to one question and a brief follow-up. To ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, press star 2. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded Tuesday, February 1, 2022. I would now like to turn the conference over to Rocky Gupta, Treasurer and Vice President of Investor Relations. Thanks, Jordan. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us as we review GM's financial results for the fourth quarter and calendar year 2021. Our conference call materials were issued earlier this afternoon and are available on the GM Investor Relations website. We are also broadcasting this call via webcast. I'm joined today by GM's Chair and CEO, Mary Vara, GM CFO, Paul Jacobson, GM Financial CEO, Dan Burse, and Cruise co-founder, Kyle Voigt. Kyle will be available to speak about Cruise's exciting progress in the Q&A portion of the call. Before we begin, I would like to direct your attention to the forward-looking statements on the first page of the chart set. The content of our call will be governed by this language. We'll now turn the call over to Mary. Hey, thanks, Rocky, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, hey, before we get into our 2021 results and 2022 outlook, I want to start with some exciting news from Cruz, which is one of our most significant growth opportunities. Kyle, Dan Kahn, Gil West, and the entire Cruz team are doing great work, and they just delivered a key milestone on the drive to commercialization to commercialize Cruz rideshare service. As Kyle has shared, Cruz team members have been taking fully driverless rides in San Francisco since November to demonstrate and refine the software and hardware ecosystem we have created together. In fact, they have logged over 20,000 miles and co completed more than 600 trips. I rode in a driverless cruise a couple weeks ago, and I can tell you it was the highlight of my career as an engineer and as the leader of General Motors. The ride is smooth and confident. It's like having an experienced and attentive driver behind the wheel. Now, as Cruise announced this morning, it is inviting members of the public to sign up for their own driverless rides through a wait list on the Cruise website. This is the first truly driverless ride hail service offered to members of the public in a dense urban environment. To maximize its learnings, Cruise will prioritize use cases that are natural fits for autonomous ride sharing. This major milestone brings Cruise even closer to offering its first paid rides and generating $50 billion in annual revenue by the end of the decade. It also means that the SoftBank Vision Fund will invest, as planned, another $1.35 billion in Cruise. This is another strong vote of confidence in the Cruise team, its technology, and the services it's creating. Additionally, Cruise continues to advance the strong relationship it has established with Walmart, where the team is making progress on driverless deliveries of groceries to customers every day. With this incremental investment and the investments from General Motors in companies like Honda, Microsoft, and Walmart, Cruise is very well capitalized to scale its business when the origin production comes online at Factory Zero late this year. So, Kyle, congrats. Now I want to turn to the significant investments we are making to expand both our battery cell and EV assembly capacity. We believe our strategy to scale a common Ultium cell, component set, and platform will create significant long-term value for all GM stakeholders. We also recognize that we need to launch more EVs faster, so that's exactly what we are going to do. As you know, the GMC Hummer EV is already in the market. Cadillac Lyric deliveries begin in less than 60 days, and additional Bright Drop EV600 production begins at CAMI late this year, where we'll launch with an annual capacity of 30,000 units and the ability to nearly double production by mid-decade. The Chevrolet Silverado EV launches next spring, and the Chevrolet Equinox and Blazer EVs will also reach the market in 2023. We have the teams working to accelerate the volume curves for all of these launches and to resume both EV and EUV production as soon as possible. And we have set a target to deliver 400,000 EVs in North America over the course of 2022 and 2023. As you know, we have also announced additional battery cell and assembly capacity investments in Michigan that will give us more than 1 million units of EV capacity in North America by the end of 2025, and this includes 600,000 full-size trucks. This is in addition to more than 1 million units of EV capacity in China over the same time frame. 
And I can tell you right now, one million units in North America won't be enough to meet the steep inflection in demand that we expect starting mid-decade for our EVs. That's why we will continue to convert ICE capacity to EVs and plan to invest in a third EV truck plant. We are formulating plans for the truck plant right now, and we will share more as we work through the details. Importantly, battery cells will not be a constraint to our long-term EV growth. Our Ultium cell JVs in Ohio and Tennessee come online in 2022 and 2023, respectively, and we will add capacity as demand grows. Our Ohio plant will launch with seven-day operations, adding 10% capacity and 200 jobs. Cell production in Michigan is scheduled to begin in late 2024. And I'm sharing today that we will announce the location of our fourth U.S. cell plant in the first half of this year. Together, these plants will support GM's EV volume growth and supply our customers in the rail, trucking, aerospace, and marine industries. Equally important for our EV strategy for North America is that it is backed by a strong, more sustainable, North American-focused supply chain that includes lithium, rare earth material, permanent magnets, cathode, cathode active material, silicon carbide, motor stators, and more. To deliver this acceleration, we are pulling ahead significant investment into the 2022 to 2025 timeframe, and we will share more details as we further refine our plans. Growing customer demand for the first wave of Ultium products strongly supports these investments. We already have more than 59,000 reservations for the GMC Hummer EV pickup and SUV. Not surprisingly, some of the first owners are very prominent figures in the sports and entertainment industries, and their initial feedback has been just out incredible. They expected a super truck, and they got one. Our next electric pickup will be the Chevrolet Silverado EV. More than 110,000 Silverado EVs are reserved so far, including reservations from more than 240 fleet operators, and the numbers keep growing every day. Some of the world's largest fleet customers, including FedEx, Verizon, Merchant Fleet, and Walmart, are adopting bright drop vehicles and their technology. All told, we have more than 25,000 production reservations for bright drop cargo vans. And customer interest in the Cadillac Lyric is growing so quickly that we'll forego a new round of reserva reservations and begin taking customer orders soon after the, de the debut edition launches in March. One of our most highly anticipated reveals this year will be the Chevrolet Equinox EV, which we previewed in January. The Verge named it the best electric car of CES, saying, there's a perception that electric vehicles are luxury items. So when General Motors said the Equinox would come with a $30,000 sticker price, it's something worth noting. The efficiencies created by the Ultium platform are a key reason why we will be able to deliver truly affordable EVs like the Equinox. Affordable EVs are part of the market that startups aren't targeting, but they are key to driving mass adoption of EVs, which is a national and a global priority. That's why we plan to follow the Equinox with an even more affordable EV. Now let's shift and talk a little bit about our other GM growth platform. Throughout the year, you will see the expansion of advanced vehicle technologies, new shopping tools, and continued progress at our new business startups. This spring, we will launch redesigns of the Chevrolet Silverado and the GMC Sierra 1500 pickups and offer them with Super Cruise with expanded capabilities that include lane change on demand and hands-free trailering. These are first for the segment. In the same time frame, GM and our dealers will begin marketing Car Bravo, our new used vehicle shopping service. This is truly a win-win. Our dealers will grow their business by offering customers online access to far more inventory than other services. In turn, we expect to drive incremental GM and GM financial revenue by selling products like OnStar Insurance, OnStar Connected Services, Accessories, and Financial Services. It will also help support strong residual values for off-lease vehicles. Then next year, we'll roll out Altify a new end-to-end -end software platform for EVs, AVs, and ICE vehicles that will have even more sweeping over-the-air capabilities than we have today. This includes the ability to backcast features to the Cadillac Lyric. Altify will be the foundation for new GM-developed and approved third-party apps, in-car subscriptions, and other connected services that enhance the customer experience and expand our revenue through the life of each vehicle. We can and we will 
keep up our aggressive pace backed by strong results. We expect to follow our record EBIT adjusted earnings in 2021 with another year of record or near record results in 2022, while investing significantly more year over year to accelerate our growth. Paul will share more details on our results and guidance in his remarks. But before I turn the call over to him, I would like to discuss our capital allocation strategy. The prospect of continued strong earnings and free cash flow, even as we invest for growth, naturally raises questions about resuming a common stock dividend. As we move forward, we will consider all opportunities to return excess capital to shareholders, but we will not reinstate a dividend at this time. Our clear priority is to accelerate our EV plan and drive growth, and we want to maintain maximum flexibility to invest as opportunities arise across our growth platforms, including many of the accelerated plans I've outlined today. I think we've consistently demonstrated that we're a team that delivers on our commitments. That's more important now than ever with the incredible opportunities in front of us. So now I'm gonna turn the call over to Paul who will walk us through the quarter and our outlook. Then Paul, Dan Burst, Cal Vote, and I will take your questions. Thank you, Mary, and good afternoon, everyone. We sincerely appreciate you taking the time to join us. As Mary mentioned, the strong results last year, including record full year EBIT adjusted and EBIT adjusted margins, are a reflection of the hard work and execution from our team and the underlying strength of our business. We're seeing strong demand for our products, especially our trucks and SUVs, and we are striving again this year to produce as many of them as we can. I want to thank the entire GM team once more for the execution during this past year. The cash that we generate today is funding the transformation of GM in pursuit of the growth strategy we shared last year at our investor day. We see a path to doubling revenue by 2030 while expanding margins, with significant opportunities in software, services, and new businesses in electric and autonomous vehicles. Now let's get into the results. While we face the well-publicized global semiconductor challenges and continued pressure from COVID protocols throughout the world, the GM team once again delivered tremendous results in 2021 through our production prioritization and work across our value chain. For the full year, we generated $127 billion in revenue, $14.3 billion in EBIT-adjusted, 11.3% EBIT-adjusted margin, $7.07 in EPS-diluted-adjusted, and $2.6 billion in adjusted automotive free cash flow. In the fourth quarter, we generated $34 billion in revenue, $2.8 billion in EBIT adjusted, 8.5% EBIT adjusted margin, $1.35 in EPS diluted adjusted, and $6.4 billion in adjusted automotive free cash flow. Free cash flow in the quarter was largely driven by working capital rewind as we were able to complete and wholesale over 80,000 vehicles that had previously been built without certain components, as well as dividends from GM Financial. We saw improved semiconductor availability in the fourth quarter compared to the third quarter, which enabled us to increase our wholesale sequentially while substantially reducing our inventory of vehicles built without certain components. And we expect ongoing semiconductor availability improvements throughout 2022. We also realized strong price and mixed performance in North America through our production prioritization actions and our go-to-market strategy. Additionally, used vehicle prices and strong credit performance continued to drive record results at GM Financial. So let's take a closer look at North America. In Q4, GM North America delivered EBIT adjusted of $2.2 billion as we continued to see robust customer demand for our products and tight dealer inventory driving strong transaction prices. These results were somewhat better than our December updated guidance expectations as we saw continued volume and cost improvements. On a year-over-year basis in the fourth quarter, we saw volume decreases and increased investments in growth, partially offset by pricing and mix. U.S. dealer inventories ended the year at around 200,000 units, of which only approximately 25% is grounded stock resulting in continued high sales turns of around 10 days. Moving to GM International, in the fourth quarter, GMI EBIT adjusted was approximately $0.3 billion, relatively flat year over year. China equity income was $0.2 billion in the quarter with continued strong mix, 
stabilization in pricing and material cost performance offset by semiconductor and commodity impacts. As we referenced last quarter, our international business outside of China has made substantial progress on our path to sustainable profitability. GMI EBIT adjusted excluding China equity income achieved profitability in the fourth quarter despite continued semiconductor pressure, and the Chevrolet brand has regained its retail market share leadership in South America. A few comments on GM Financial and the Corp segment. GM Financial concluded another extremely strong year with Q4 EBT adjusted of $1.2 billion, with record full-year EBT adjusted of $5 billion. GM Financial paid an additional $1.7 billion dividend in Q4. That brings the total GM Financial dividends to $3.5 billion in 2021, equivalent to how much we paid for the company. Going forward, we expect GM Financial dividends to moderate as earnings normalize and we continue to grow the asset base. Corp EBIT adjusted in Q4 was down year over year by about half a billion dollars, driven by the non-recurrence of mark-to-market gains recognized in Q4 2020. Now turning to our outlook for 2022. Today we see a stabilizing semiconductor environment and envision wholesales getting to a normalized run rate towards the beginning of the third quarter with a target of around 800,000 units in North America on a quarterly basis. We expect total company volume to increase 25 to 30 percent year over year with a majority of the increase occurring in the second half of the year, primarily due to the production constraints in the second half of 2021. Sequentially, we expect the positive trend to continue with Q1 wholesale volumes up 20 to 25 percent versus Q4 2021. In 2022, we anticipate light industry sales of approximately 16 million units, dealer stock to remain tight, and the dynamic where production is the gating factor for sales volumes continuing into 2022. As you think about the mix of this incremental volume, remember that in 2021, we largely protected our high demand truck production. As a result, the incremental volume in 2022 will be mostly weighted towards small and mid-sized SUVs and sedans. Now let's turn to our expectations for growth investments and margins. We're at a very important stage in the growth and development of some of our key businesses, and we are taking the very intentional step of investing heavily into them to accelerate our expansion. Cruise expenses are expected to increase as they rapidly approach commercialization and hire around 500 additional employees increasing their workforce by around 20% to advance technology as as well as accelerate the operational infrastructure to grow and expand. We also expect to see some wage rate pressure as we continue to attract top talent to the company. Corporate expenses are expected to increase by approximately $0.5 billion as we expand the bright drop business, business, excuse me, including product development and manufacturing spend to prepare the CAMI facility for ELCV production later in the year, and expanding customer pilots for the EP1 electric cart, which we expect will drive software and services recurring revenue opportunities. We're to continue to roll out OnStar insurance across the country. We're in 46 states today and expect to be in all 50 by the second quarter. We're to develop new products at GM Defense and continue to incubate new ideas to drive incremental growth and value in the future. We're also expecting to invest another $1.5 billion in expenses to expand software development and further accelerate our EV portfolio, which includes close to $1 billion of incremental engineering and software-related development. These investments are building the foundation to grow and accelerate our AV, EV, and software businesses as we aggressively launch approximately 20 EV products in North America and more than 30 EV products globally through 2025 and introduce Ultify. These investments will also drive meaningful revenue growth starting in 2023, initially from EVs, Bright Drop, and Cruise, but expanding to software and services as we launch Ultify and grow other new business opportunities such as OnStar Insurance and GM Defects in the next few years. We're now also expecting commodities and logistics cost pressure of $2.5 billion year over year, primarily weighted to the front half of 2022. From a non-operating perspective, we expect a combined $1 billion year over year headwind 
from the non-recurrence of mark-to-market gains we achieved in 2021 and a reduction in net pension income as we further de-risk the plan asset profile. I want to reiterate that despite all of this, we expect to generate 10% North America EBIT-adjusted margins in 2022, inclusive of the increased expenditures related to our growth investments and highlighting our ability to fund these initiatives through internally generated cash flow. In China, we expect equity income from our joint ventures to exceed $1 billion and remain relatively flat year over year. We anticipate a modest increase in volume which will be offset by a more normalized mix, competitive pricing environment, and increased investments as we prepare to bring more EV products to market. We expect GM financial performance to be in the 3 dollars to $4 billion range, as we do not expect a repeat of some of the 2021 allowance releases, and we anticipate that credit performance and used vehicle prices will begin to moderate. Assuming continued steady demand for new vehicles, no significant new economic or supply chain challenges in 2022. We expect EBIT adjusted in the 13 to $15 billion range, EPS diluted adjusted in the $6.25 to $7.25 range, and adjusted automotive free cash flow in the $7 to $9 billion range. Adjusted automotive free cash flow will be driven by strong earnings and working capital rewind as volumes increase. We expect capital spend to be in the $9 to $10 billion range in 2022, including investments in our Ultium battery cell JVs, and expect similar levels of spending over the next several years. In summary, we had a strong finish to the year, and our results are a reflection of the team's focus and execution in the face of a continued challenging environment. In 2022, we expect strong commercial performance, and we are aggressively reinvesting some of our short-term EBIT improvement to accelerate our EVAV journey while still driving similar results to our record performance in 2021. This demonstrates the strength of our underlying business, the strength of our truck and SUV franchises, our industry-leading customer loyalty, and world-class manufacturing and design capabilities. We will continue to leverage these competitive advantages as we vastly expand our battery cell and EV assembly capacity in North America to lead the industry. This concludes our opening comments, and we'll now move to the Q&A portion of the call. A reminder to analysts, we are asking to limit yourself to one question and a brief follow-up so that they may get everyone on the call. Our first question comes from the line of Rod Lash with Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hi, everybody. Congratulations on these results and the outlook. Um, I, I, I'll ask two questions. First, um, just a financial one for Mary and Paul. You, you guys have almost $22 billion of cash. Your, your U.S. pension is now about fully funded. You've got $40 billion of liquidity, and you've shown a lot of resiliency in different financial conditions and operating conditions and, and, and are talking about $7 to $9 billion of free cash next year. So. That's going to lead to some speculation on where the uh, these investments could be that um, that that, that um, you're contemplating instead of um, cash returns. So can you maybe talk about are, are there investments that you're thinking about that are large enough that would consume cash of that magnitude? So Rod, um, hey, thanks uh, for the question. And you know, as we look at it, we're going to follow the capital allocation framework that we're going to continue to invest in opportunities that allow us to generate returns, uh, return on invested capital of greater than 20%, maintain an investment grade balance sheet, and then return the balance to shareholders. You know, we we talked about a lot of uh, you know it pull ahead and acceleration to our EV strategy. And, you know, as we work through that, we will follow, follow that. We'll look for those good investments, and then we'll follow the capital allocation framework. So I think in, or in February, it's a little early um, to look at that, but we'll provide more guidance through the year on that. Okay. And I um, was hoping to ask a question of Kyle. Um, so you're, you're currently uh, – congratulations, by the way, on, on the milestones that you've achieved. And um, – these, these operations um, look pretty impressive. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what the uh, operations look like in prime time, so during the day, more congested periods? And, um, you know, 2021 seems like it's kind of a step between R&D and commercialization. Can you maybe give us a little bit more of a sense of what commercial scale will look like and 
what kind of uh, pace of expansion we should be thinking about. At one point, you you um, were talking about, I think, a new city every six months, something along those lines. But any update on that? Hi, Rod. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, it has been a very eventful day for us and a really good uh, 2021 as we enter early commercialization. Um, you know, our approach to bringing driverless cars to dense urban environments has been a cautious and careful one. You know, we're starting with limited hours of the day, limited geofence, and what we're looking to do is uh, confirm that the performance and functionality of our system matches expectations, and also that we give uh, the communities where we're operating a little bit of time to acclimate, especially, you know, San Francisco, which is the first one, first dense urban environment that's ever experienced this. Uh, so we're going uh, slowly and cautiously, but as we see things click and evidence that uh, uh, performance is meeting expectations, the focus becomes exactly what you mentioned, which is how quickly can we expand this uh, to cover a uh, larger service area, more hours, uh, serve more customers in San Francisco, but then cities beyond that. And so we've been uh, developing the foundational technologies to do those expansions in the background, and we've learned a lot by our operation in other cities like Arizona, uh, or sorry, in Arizona and in Michigan. Uh, so we have a pretty good idea of what's around the corner, but you know we're gated by safety and we're just at the very early days, so it's hard to know our exact rate of expansion. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from the line of John Murphy from Bank of America. Your line is open. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just a, a first question that's a, a, just on the, on, the, on the core business. I mean, when we think about the 25 to 30 percent increase in, in wholesale, um, you know, and we imagine that's mimics production. I'm just curious, you know, as you think about that, in the context of a 16 million unit SAR, it seems like there will be some inventory build, but not not uh, not a lot. So if you wind that together with Car Bravo, it does seem like you're pushing to keep ATPs high, mix relatively high and maybe transition some of your entry-level buyers or entry-level product into the used car market, which supports resist more structurally going forward. It just seems like you're getting a very good circular reference, keeping a lid on inventory, and then winding it up with Car Bravo. I mean, what is the real opportunity here on Car Bravo, and then ultimately what could it mean for sort of this, you know, inventory management on, on the new vehicle side? It just seems like it's a, a very intertwined, very positive story. Yeah. Hey, John. Good afternoon. Thanks for the question. You know, what, what I would say that for 2022, it's largely more of a function of what we continue to believe is large pent-up demand for new vehicles um, that hasn't been met in 2021 because of some of the production challenges. Certainly what we saw as we were able to complete those vehicles, there was a little bit more going through the system of production. And, uh, and as we talked about in the prepared remarks, those vehicles continue to sell very, very rapidly. So despite the production increases we saw in Q4, uh, we're still not really building inventory that much. Um, and I think that's going to probably continue throughout the year with largely showing up in, in transit rather than on lots. Um, that's really on the consumer. And I think that's the short term. When you think about Car Bravo, I would think about it in terms of the, the volume and the access to inventory that we have through GM Financial, through the dealer network, it really is unprecedented level that gives customers much, much better choice and, and variety across, uh, across the country. And, and we can do this in a coordinated fashion, largely because of, of where we are with vehicles coming off lease, um, the GM Financial inventory is uh, across the board. So we actually see this as a really, really strong opportunity in and of itself to expand the customer relationship and uh, the entire sort of universe of the customer that uh, that we're working through, and we talked about it in Investor Day. Okay, and then just to, to follow up on that, I mean, it seems that you're you're tightening up and, and growing the core to drive more profits to fund the future. Um, you know, the, this cruise news today, um, you know, and I'll sort of add my congratulations too on that to everybody on the team. Um, you know, as you grow in San Francisco and then you know repopulate the strategy in other markets. I mean, how do we think about the, the fleet um, and the capital required there to kind of follow up on Rod's question? I mean, could there be a huge call on capital that could actually have very good returns? Um, and what is the earnings potential on that $50 billion? Perhaps I got to mention the margin is much higher than the core business at 10%. So, I mean, you know, how, how should we think about those earnings in, in, in 2030? So capital requirement, you know, will you own the fleet and where the, the earnings go? 
Yeah, uh, keep, keep in mind, John, that, you know, we announced last year that GM Financial has uh, uh, committed to a $5 billion line of credit to help finance the origins. So I think when we look at capital um, for expansion uh, as well as um, for the continued development, we're not seeing any constraints in that uh, at all. Um, Cruz is very well capitalized. They're very well prepared um, for the expansion phase as they continue to roll this out and achieve their milestones. I'm sorry, and the, and the profitability potential on this, I mean, it just seems like, you know, 10%, you know, $5 billion is, is just a, you know, an opening bid. It's probably a tremendous amount higher than that. I mean, what are you roughly thinking run rate on potential profitability? Hey, John, I think, you know, as we look, we, we see there's a huge first mover opportunity to, to go and, you know, provide an exceptional customer experience. And so, you know, we're gonna, we do think there's tremendous um, margin potential in this business, but we also think growth is really important. So you'll see us balance that in the early days uh, to, to really get a foothold, a solid foothold in a leadership position. So, you know, down the road we see tremendous profit, but we're going to really, we're going to scale fast. Seems like a huge opportunity. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from the line of Joe Spock with RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, uh, appreciate the update on the Lordstown and Spring Hill um, Ultium cells uh, build out um, and, and, and when those are starting. I was wondering if you could provide a little bit more color in terms of either from a run rate basis or, or, or maybe just an absolute basis, where you think each of those um, uh, or how long it's going to take those facilities to get up to their stated capacity. And then maybe just um, uh, a quick aside, like if, if Lordstown's opening mid-22, where are you actually getting Ultium cells for, you know, the Hummer, the Bright Drop, and the Lyric? Uh, today we're getting those from, from LG. But, uh, you know, as we look, we're going to ramp up those plants uh, as quickly as we can with one coming online on 22, one on 23, and then one late 24 and one yet to be announced. So, uh, you know, we're going to accelerate those as fast as, as we can. As I said in, in my prepared remarks, we've already, you know, found ways to add um, capacity from an operating perspective and efficiencies in the plant. So, uh, you know, we're just going to keep going full out. Uh, because we see the opportunity for substantial EV volume growth um, in this period of time. Okay. And then I guess following up on that, and I know you mentioned in your remarks, Mary, you're not, you don't really think you're constrained by um, your, your uh, cell supply here, but it does seem like you have at least, um, you know, over the next year or so, maybe an allocation decision um, of, of what, what programs those cells go to. So for instance, in 23, you have, you know, both the Silverado and the Equinox. So how do you go about deciding that, whether it sort of goes towards, um, you know, uh, potentially a more profitable vehicle or, you know, a segment where you see, you know, less competition and more, more potential white space? Well, I, I think, you know, we're working to, um, to expand our capa uh, capability to accelerate all of those models. As I said, you know, we're just seeing such strong demand and that's caused the team to really go back and look and say, okay, let's double down and go faster from an acceleration perspective. Clearly the cells will be uh, um, something that, you know, we'll look to, to grow as well. One of the reasons why we're announcing uh, the battery plant that we already did in Michigan and we'll shortly be announcing the fourth battery plant as, as well as continuing to work with LG. So, you know, we're, we're focused right now not on trade-offs but on an uh, uh, enabling as many as we can during this period of time. And you heard me say that between 22 and 23, you know, we want to, our plan is to have over 400,000 uh, EVs into market in North America. And we're just going to keep working to improve that. And I have a lot of uh, confidence in the GM team that uh, when you give them a clear challenge, um, they rise to the occasion. Thanks. Our next question comes from the line of Adam Jonas with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Thanks, uh, everybody. I had a question about the EV models and implied volume per SKU. Uh, I guess I ask it like this. If you were starting an EV company from scratch, would you launch 30 different models over a three- or four-year period? I understand why... I guess I understand why GM with the brands in different regions and things is tempted to do it, but if you had the alternative, if you consider the alternative of higher volume, maybe hundreds and hundreds of thousands of units 
per model, but a small number of models. So, so Adam, um, you know, we're going to we're going to go for both. And you know, mm -hmm. from a General Motors perspective, I think when you look at how we've approached the technology and the investments we've made in Altium and how we're looking at the portfolio, a full portfolio. Because, again, if you look at and, – and, by the way, we think several of those models are going to be, um, you know, over 100,000 units um, or, or more than that uh, as we mm -hmm. do that. So I really would say, Adam, we're going for both. And, you know, it's one thing when you're looking at the market when it's 2%, 3%, 5%. Now we're looking by 20, 2030 to be in the you know 40 to 50 percent adoption, and to do that, you've got to meet the customer where they're at, and that's why you look at the Equinox and how uh, significant that can be, uh, the the more affordable um, EV that we're going to be doing that really gets into uh, another very important part of the market. So you have to have the proper market coverage, otherwise the customer is going to have to make trade-offs. And because of GM's capability, you know, at General Motors at any one point in time, we have almost 100 programs in flight, meaning in concept to being launched. That's the capability the GM team has. So we're moving mm -hmm. with the speed of a startup with, I think, industry-leading technology and a platform, but we're also then leveraging the capability that GM has to uh, attract and gain share and grow because of the, the vehicles that we'll have that meet their needs. Thanks, Mary. Just as a follow-up, how certain are you that the quality problems that you had with your battery partner have been resolved? Obviously, you're implying there's some improvement, but could you tell us, are, are all the issues behind you, or are there still some issues that you're working through in real time? Thanks. Sure. Um, so, Adam, you know, we're already um, putting new battery packs into existing Bolt EVs and EUVs. We wouldn't be doing that if we didn't have confidence. Uh, the LG uh, technical team and the GM team have worked together. We believe, as we said before, that it was two very um, uh, rare uh, manufacturing defects that caused the issue. And if you look at the low number of issues we had, yet the, the extraordinary um, action that we took with recalling, the, you know, the entire population, that's our commitment to safety. And... Uh, so we have found the issues. We've um, put a lot more robust processes into the manufacturing process uh, and changed uh, the way the process processing is to make sure we don't have that issue. I'd also note that, you know, th that was rich learnings um, that we had from our LG partners that have been incorporated into Ultium. So, you know, again, the experience that we've had of selling Bolt EVs for a while and Bolt EUVs, all of that learning is translated in and gives me great confidence in the quality of the Ultium platform and the, the packs that we're putting into the Bolt EVs and EUVs right now. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Adam. Our next question comes from the line of E.T. McKelly with Citi. Your line is open. Uh, great. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just uh, two questions, maybe first on going back to AV from Mary and Kyle. You know, Mary, I think in the past you referred to the opportunity in personal consumer AV as upside potential to your 2030 targets. I was hoping you could update us on the vision you have for consumers AV at, at GM as well as uh, Cruz's role within that in the long run. Well, you know, for right now, um, with the significant announcement that Cruz made today, we want, you know, the team, like, 99.9% .9 focused on making sure that we seize the significant opportunity in rideshare and rideshare delivery. Um, and we, we said um, most recently at the uh, end of last year that we see, um, and at CES, that we see um, the opportunity for potentially as early as mid-decade to have personal autonomous vehicles, which is, uh, you know, really an additive thing for crews because it puts more nodes on the network uh, it opens up another another market. So, you know, we're very focused on rideshare and rideshare delivery. So this is something that we see potentially in um, in mid-decade that we can uh, make both businesses grow. So a huge opportunity. And I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, thanks, Mary. It's a natural fit, you know, like uh, retail AVs would increase the total volume of sensors and compute systems we're building. It's more vehicles that um, are on our common platforms um, that power these fleets of driverless cars. So it drives down the cost, you know, on a unit basis and really reinforces and bolsters the core robo-taxi business. So we see it as a really a win-win situation um, where it improves the economics of the robo-taxi business but also, um, you know, enables a, a new market and, and the expansion of the positive impact from this technology. 
that, that's very, very helpful. Uh, maybe a quick follow-up, but maybe for Paul. Um, hoping you could dimension the, um, the variable profit opportunity from the refreshed uh, full-size pickup trucks I think are, are coming in the spring, both in terms of maybe pricing opportunities with the new content as well as any opportunities with the upgraded electrical architecture. Well, thanks, Isai. What I would say is, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, you know what we see right now and what we continue to see is a really, really strong consumer preference, especially as uh, they're buying up on features and amenities. We see that across the board in the in the Denali brands, High Country brands, et cetera. That you know, I think is going to continue to pay big dividends for us as we roll out. Um, you know, the, the new vehicles going forward. So without getting into specifics on, on vehicle margins and, uh, and profitability, we're very excited about what that's going to bring. And we think that the, the consumer is uh, going to be really, really um, positive around them. Great. That's all very helpful. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Emanuel Rosner with Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, two questions, please. Uh, the first one, uh, could you please describe the current supply chain um, environment, any constraints still left on the uh, chip availability? And in particular, was, uh, I'd be interested to hear what gives you confidence that you ha would have sufficient chip availability to produce 25 to 30 percent more vehicle in 2022 versus uh, 2021? Admittedly, you were hit maybe a bit harder than, than other players, but uh, Obviously, this is a nice uh, size bounce back. Yeah, uh, Emmanuel, thanks for the question. Um, you know, what we're sharing is, is what we see with the work that we've done with all of the semiconductor manufacturers and, and our plans for this, uh, for this year. So, you know, of course, and, and Paul said, um, you know, if there's significant COVID disruptions or other natural disasters, that, that could have an impact. But we're pretty, um, we're seeing, definitely seeing improvement in first quarter over fourth quarter. We saw fourth quarter better than third quarter. And we really see with um, the plans we have in place now, uh, by the time we get to third and fourth quarter, you know, we're going to be, um, you know, really starting to, to uh, see the, the semiconductor constraints diminish. Uh, so that's what we're working to achieve uh, across um, all of our platforms and, and across the globe, frankly, with all of our suppliers. But that's, that's our best current outlook that we're sharing. Great. Just a quick aside on this, and then I have a second question on the cruise. But just a clarification, the 25 to 30%, you're, you're confident you could do this um, in North America? Since uh, I think for China, I think Paul said that uh, you were looking probably at more stable volume over here. Uh, hey, hey, Emmanuel, 25 to 30 percent is a global production number. So there's there's some in the U.S. and there's some uh, in the uh, GM International as well. Understood. And then second second question would be um, on cruise. Uh, Mary, what are your current thoughts on optimal timing to bring this to uh, to capital markets? Not not just because of uh, growing capital needs, you know, with the commercialization, which uh, seems like you have. That already well in place, but also as a way to potentially unlock uh, some uh, additional value for shareholders. Yes, Emmanuel. You know, um, I have always said, uh, and it's you know the belief that's held by you know I'd say the cruise board and the GM board that we're going to do what's in the best interest of shareholders to create long-term value. And we do not see that a capital raise event is something that we need in the near term. Uh, where cruise is well capitalized and has strong financial support from its investors. Uh, GM is well-funded, and so there, we don't really think we need to raise additional funds at this time. Uh, we also um, are committed to making sure we have competitive uh, compensation packages at Cruise to attract and retain um, the best and the brightest talent to achieve the objectives and our, our uh, growth uh, initiatives here. So, you know, my, my answer to be would, you know, we're always going to look and do what's in the best interest, but as we look now, we're in, you know, the first chapter um, – and there's still so much that can be accomplished with a frictionless environment between Cruise and GM, and that's what we're really focused is getting the technology out um, safely and then uh, really uh, growing at a pace where we can have leadership. Understood. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Dan Levy with Credit Suite. Your line is open. Hi. Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the questions. Um, Maybe uh, first, uh, just a, a question for you, Paul, on uh, the parameters of the guidance, uh, the EBIT guidance. I know you haven't articulated 
uh, you know, guidance by segment. There's some details there. But if you're just giving the comments for wholesales up 25 to 30 percent and you're reaffirming the 10 percent GM North America margin guide, even after factoring in the GMF decline and the higher spend for software and crews, uh, I guess I'm wondering how you reconcile to having that lower half of the guidance because it seems like with that 10% uh, North America gui uh, margin guidance alone and that 25 to 30% volume growth, um, it pretty easily gets you to the upper half of the guidance. So in what scenario would you get to that lower half of the guide or is that just conservatism for you know the unknown unknowns? Yeah, hey Dan, thanks for the question. You know, what I would say is this is, this is very much a, a midpoint convention guide as we're thinking this, obviously we've expanded the range over prior years, which I think is a reflection of the volatility that we've seen uh, in the place. Um, you know, I would, I would be careful about extrapolating too much across kind of the uh, profitability from the incremental vehicles, as we talked about and very intentional in the prepared remarks. You know, the, a lot of that incremental volume is coming in, in um, you know, at a, at a lower contribution than what we've seen from the full-size trucks and SUVs. Uh, going forward. That's just where the capacity is for us going forward. So, you know, what I would say is with a really robust consumer and a, and a strong continued environment, you know, we would probably trend towards the high end of that. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of volatility. So to the extent that we see consumer weakness, we see more supply chain pressure, we see more disruptions in the global logistics platform that impacts production, then we could be at the lower end of the number. But we wanted to give a range. Uh, that was focused around the midpoint of our expectation, as well as gave some comfort and some deference to uh, the volatility that we see. Uh, okay, yeah. thank, thank you, that's um, helpful. And then second, um, Mary, maybe uh, just a, a question on Ultium. I'd, you know, I'd like to revisit the, the, the platform and the, and the benefits. So, you know, if we go to EV Silverado, and I know you haven't unveiled the full set of specs, but one one question with, which has come up in the investor community is that on some of the metrics um, relative to you know the other competition that's out there, it's it's not showing the type of advantage over your competitors that maybe some had anticipated. So maybe we can just zoom out and think as you're launching the Ultium vehicles, what are the benefits that we're going to see uh, versus your competitors? Is it just these are going to be more profitable vehicles? Is it that uh, it's going to show up in other areas of, of battery efficiency. Um, is it that this can help unlock more range that others can't have? So, you know, what are the benefits of Ultium that we're going to start to see within the vehicle on a more of a call it metric basis? Yeah, well, so, I mean, I think when we look at what Ultium is providing, first of all, it's going to give us scale. And we do think as we get the full portfolio of Ultium launch, we're going to see that scale and it's going to give us uh, an advantage from a, from an overall margin perspective, but specifically for the Silverado EV, you, leveraging Ultium, we, uh, we have longer range, 400 plus miles, uh, faster charging, better towing capability. Uh, and I think you have to really look at this as opposed to, I know there's been some focus on the miles per kilowatt hour, and we haven't put all the, uh, the, the specs out, and it's going to get a very, um, with a lot of, of features that you choose. I mean, we very carefully look to say, what are we going to provide for the customer? What does the customer want in this segment? What's important to them? And when you look at more range, faster charging, more this is more capability in the real world. Then when you look at the Ultium platform, also it gives us the opportunity to have a, a mid-gate, which uh, gives much more flexibility. Um, the, also, you know, being able to, to drive these trucks, that people are going to see the benefit of a fully integrated battery pack um, and body structure which gives us a mass um, advantage as well as, I, we think, superior vehicle dynamics. So, uh, and, and then, you know, from an Ultium perspective, the other thing I would say as it relates to the truck portfolio, it's going to give us an opportunity to have a full truck portfolio faster. Uh, and, you know, as we've seen over the last couple of years, think about when we rolled out um, this current generation of trucks, uh, you know, we went um, high feature and high value, and, you know, we, we've grown our truck share capability. So we know that truck customer, there's some that want high value, some that want high feature. Uh, Ultium is going to give us the opportunity to, again, um, delight the customer with what they're specifically looking for as opposed to, you know, one or two point solutions um, off of a retrofitted platform. Great. Thank you very much. 
Our next question comes from the line of Colin Langan with Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Oh, great. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, I just want to, sorry, I hope it's not too basic. I just want to clarify on the, the cruise announcement, your, uh, people are able to sign up on the wait list. Does that mean you're actually going to be able to do it soon or is it like today or is that like you're on a wait list and then in a couple months you, they're able to actually start taking rides? Any, just want to clarify that. It, it kind of felt like it might have been today. And then I assume that means you have that sort of final license I think you had talked about that you needed in San Francisco to deploy. Uh, hi, Colin. Thank, thanks for the question. Um, so the wait list is open, and based on the early demand we saw this morning, there's going to be a pretty long list pretty quickly. Um, and we are starting small with a limited number of vehicles, limited hours. And so, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to get to everyone on that list uh, in the next uh, week or two. And so it could be some time before people on the wait list get to, to use the product. But we are, uh, we have already started carrying members of the public, and we're working through that wait list now, adding new people every day. Um, the other part of your question, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that answered it. You, I assume then you've got that last license I think you had mentioned. Oh, yeah, on the permit, we still have uh, five out of the six necessary permits to operate a fared rideshare service. So as of today, all of the rides are free. And uh, we filed the last uh, the application for the last remaining permit in November last year, and we continue to work uh, with the CPUC, California Public Utilities Commission, and answer questions they have about that application as they pop up. Um, so stay tuned for more news on that. Thank you. And then just I wanted to follow up on the, the 25 to 30 again. Sorry. I, other automakers are announcing cuts, so it's a bit surprising. I mean, what kind of line of sight do you have? I mean, is it just that you have maybe a bigger buffer stock now, that you're maybe more able to swap out some of these chips? It just uh, feels a little risky considering it seems to have been surprised uh, over the, the last year that the supply wasn't there, and it seems like a very fragile semi-pipeline, it seems. Uh, any sort of visibility there that you could provide? Well, uh, again, as I said, uh, you know, we we have been working closely with our supply base, uh, with the tier ones as well as the semiconductors. You know, we said last year that we were going to work deep into the into the tiered base and understand the capabilities. Uh, you know, we were hit pretty hard last um, last uh, year, third quarter with Malaysia. Because uh, it just so happened that the facilities that have a lot of GM business happened to be hard hit by COVID, and you know you, you saw the the losses we suffered there. So I think that's a bit of it. But you know this this is our best estimate with the detailed work that we've been doing, you know, all last year and this year. Now you know we still get surprises, and then we work to um, to to solve those issues either with an engineering solution or making trade offs uh, between vehicles. We believe we're going to continue to do that. But what we're sharing with you is, you know, based on everything we know today, based on the commitments of the supply base, and, you know, barring some major COVID disruption or some ma major national, natural disaster or supply chain disruption, this is what we think we're going to be able to do. Yeah, and, and, Colin, if I can just add to that, you know, I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, understand some of the skepticism, especially based on the volatility and where others are. Um, going forward, but this is why we wanted to add the, the point in there about where we see Q1. Um, you know, we're coming off of a lower baseline in the second half of the year, uh, largely because of the impact that Mary mentioned, but, you know, the, the run rate that we've seen sequentially from 3Q to 4Q to 1Q is giving us a heightened level of confidence. It, it doesn't mean that things won't pop up, but certainly what we're seeing in the very, very near term is giving us a little bit more confidence and I think the general consensus is that, you know, things will be more stable in the second half of the year than in the first half of the year. So that's kind of how we're extrapolating our expectations. Okay, thanks. Our next question comes from the line of Ryan Brinkman with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hi. Thanks for all the color on the 2022 outlook, including relative to both volume and pricing. I'm curious uh, for your thoughts on mix in 22. So, for example, as, you know, chip supply uh, continues to hopefully normalize, does that mean you may produce more modestly priced or lower trim model vehicles, including for rental customers, et cetera? You know, what's the right way to think about how much of the much richer mix has been supply-driven with automakers, including yourselves, opting to produce only higher-end vehicles and so could maybe unwind versus, you know, how much of the much richer mix, uh, mix is uh, – you know, maybe more uh, sustainable demand-driven, for example, with consumers, you know, increasingly demanding these high-end features. What do you think? 
Well, um, thanks for the question, Ryan. You know, I, I think we continue to to see and have talked all through 2021 about the strength of the consumer and the strength of the uh, the new models, especially in the full size trucks and SUVs, and how customers were buying up for them. So. Um, that there's nothing that's changed underlying in the consumer from that standpoint. The comment that we made in the prepared remarks was largely a function of the increased volume um, because we were running full out on a lot of the full-size trucks and SUVs. There is some incremental production capabilities, but really a lot of the unmet uh, production or underutilized production that was uh, hit in 21 was in the crossover smaller SUVs and sedans. Um, so by definition, that's where a lot of the production uh, increases and volume increases are going to be in 2022. I, I don't think that that changes mix. Um, we're going to continue to watch that uh, with the consumer um, going through 2022, and it's something that we can adjust um, uh, on the fly as we see that going forward. But no reason to believe that the strength of the consumer is deteriorating from what we saw in 2021. And the only thing I'd add, Paul, is, you know, then when you look at the new um, full-size trucks uh, with the enhancements that we've made uh, and, and, frankly, even offering some uh, further up-level models, I think that's just a, another huge opportunity for us. So I think this can be a positive year for, for that. And, and, again, we focused on those vehicles that we have no um, – we're already running full out, so we have no capacity to make up. Um, which, you know, kind of puts a little more color onto what Paul said about where the opportunity to add this year is. Very helpful. Thank you both. And just lastly, maybe a related follow-up question on if there might now be a, you know, new normal that you see in terms of U.S. industry sales. We used to say that normalized U.S. demand was around 17 million, and it still did average around 17 million for a long time, but, you know, that was also when vehicles cost uh, 30 or $35,000 versus you know, now they're more like forty or forty-five thousand dollars. So, just curious if you have any updated thoughts on uh, any new normal in terms of you know sales and pricing, et cetera. I, I don't know if there's anything normal right now when you look at all of the uh, the challenges that the industry is still facing. As Paul said, we think we've got a large pent-up demand, especially for GM vehicles, uh, and you know, strong full-size trucks coming out. We continue to see just incredibly strong. Uh, demand for a full-size SUVs and mid-size crossovers. So I, I think it's too early to, to declare normal when we're still impacted by the semiconductor shortage. Uh, you know, they're still buying behavior uh, as an outcome of COVID and some of the um, stimul you know, the, the support that was provided. So I think it's going to take a little, little while before we declare normal. Okay, very helpful. Thank you. For our last question, comes from the line of Brian Johnson with Barclays. Your line is open. Yes, hi, team. It's uh, Stephen Hempel on for Brian. Um, just, just two questions here from, from us. In terms of the um, kind of consolidating the semiconductor purchases in the three families and the co-development, I guess where do we stand on that? And then what's the kind of most expected time frame when that, that could add to, um, you know, incremental chip supply? You know, that's a, that's a midterm type of solution. Um, clearly, you know, it's full speed ahead of working with the partners that we announced and, you know, getting to um, the, the families and so reducing complexity, which we think will, uh, you know, allow us to secure supply uh, in addition to the relationships that we're creating with these uh, strategic partners. But that's a, a midterm solution, not a short-term solution. Okay. And then um... – I guess a somewhat related question in terms of the long-term margin target laid out at the capital markets day, 12 to 14 percent margins. It looks like as we um, go into 2022, there is a decent amount of step up in investment for some of these related businesses. I, I guess the move out to 2030, should we be expecting a kind of a directionally linear move towards that 12 to 14 percent, or should we be expecting some years to be kind of flattish or, or even potentially down as we shift out of um, ice in the buzz and bring on new businesses. Hey, Stephen, it's Paul. So what, what I would say is it's a, it's a little bit lumpy between now and then because if you think about the trajectory, the number one um, priority and foundation that we're building is getting the EV fleet out there. Um, so you're going to see a lot of the revenue growth really driven by EVs um, over the next uh, few years. And as you get into the latter half of the decade, and you've got the Ultify platform out there and growing that foundation through electric vehicles, you're going to start to see what we think is going to be a pretty quick ramp up 
in the software. So the revenue growth is going to be a little bit more steady, especially as we look at what Cruise is doing going forward. Um, the margin performance is probably lags a little bit because of some of the higher margin revenue opportunities from software and, and the connected vehicles are, are, going to be, are going to come after we get that foundation built uh, in the latter part of the decade. Okay, uh, understood. Thanks for taking our questions. Thank you. I'd now like to turn the call over to Mary Barra for her closing comments. Thanks, Jordan, and thanks, everybody, for your questions. Um, you know, I want to uh, close again by thanking the GM team, um, you know, broadly, including the GMF team, our union partners, our dealers, and our suppliers. You know, the work that they did together, um, seizing opportunities, addressing challenges is what allowed us to have this record performance, and we take that uh, collaboration and problem-solving agility and resiliency into 2022, and we apply that to uh, continuing to accelerate our EV transformation, the work in software, and, uh, and of course, supporting our cruise um, uh, 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 company as well. So I couldn't be more excited about 2022 and what the year and how it can unfold. I hope you see and you, you see the clear sense of determination that we have, and we will move even faster to deliver on our commitments and achieve the growth uh, that we know is right in front of us. So. Uh, want to assure you that we'll keep you updated every step of the way, but 22 is going to be an exciting year. Thank you. That concludes the conference call for today. Thank you for joining us.